Our subject is eternal security and assurance. Eternal security, many of you will remember this in your catechism as the preservation of the saints. That's one of the five points of Calvinism. It's the last one. You know, it comes out as tulip. One is total depravity. And the last one is the preservation, T-U-L-I-P, is the preservation of the saints. And the preservation of the saints actually is a wrong term because they do not persevere very much. That should be, by the way, perseverance of the saints. My, we've got that down there wrong. We did it in a hurry. But the perseverance of the saints is the great doctrine that you've heard of in former times. Now, the reason that tonight we did not take election is because election is the broad doctrine and there is a close relationship between election and eternal security. Eternal security rests upon election and the grace of God. And there is a sharp difference between eternal security and assurance. Nevertheless, they are two sides of the same subject. It's like two sides of a doa, the inside and the outside of a doa. And we're going to see that this evening. For instance, eternal security is exterior. That's the outside of the doa. Assurance is the inside of the doa. That's internal. Eternal security is objective. It depends on that which is on the outside of us. It doesn't depend on anything that's on the inside of us. The assurance depends on the inside. It is subjective. Eternal security is not experience. It's not an experience at all. Assurance is experience. And eternal security is theological while assurance is psychological. Now, every believer is eternally secure, but it is possible for a person to be saved and not have assurance. May I say that a believer who is saved and does not have assurance, he is a subnormal or an unnatural believer, but he can be a believer. But God does want us to have the assurance of our salvation. Now to see this first, we need to look at this great doctrine of eternal security and not preservation, but perseverance of the saints. Actually, the perseverance of the saints is not their perseverance at all. Now, may I make some distinctions now, and they're rather sharp, and I'd like for you to follow them very carefully. There's actually no difference between salvation and security. Will you notice that? The only salvation that God is offering tonight is eternal salvation. He's not offering any other kind. In other words, the kind of life that God is offering tonight is eternal life. Now, will you notice that? Because, and this is quite simple, and yet it's so important to see, John 3.36, and we could give, as you know, a dozen scriptures. He that believeth on the Son hath, what kind of life? Everlasting life. Now, if a believer loses that life in ten years, that's not everlasting life that he had, is it? If he loses it in 10 years, it's not everlasting life. It was 10-year life, sort of like a 15-life policy. But it's not the kind of life God is giving. So that when you tell me, I knew somebody, and for 10 years they were a very active Baptist deacon, and then he went off into sin, what about your eternal security? Well, it hasn't affected eternal security at all. It simply means that that fellow had ten-year life. He never did have eternal life or everlasting life. The one peculiarity about everlasting life and eternal life is that it's everlasting and eternal. And if it's anything short of that, 
then it's not that kind of lie. Now, the only kind of salvation God's offering today is eternal salvation. So if you get saved, you get eternal life. And if you get eternal life, then it's going to last. And if it doesn't last, you got something else. You did not get eternal life, my beloved. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, he says, he that believeth on the Son hath what kind of life? Everlasting life. You see, there is actually no difference between salvation and the security of the believer. Because the only kind of salvation God is offering and has offered is an eternal salvation. Now will you again notice something? Over in John 17, this is the great high priestly prayer of our Lord. Now will you listen to him in his prayer? Verse 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. What kind of life? Eternal life. Now listen to him. In this prayer, because he knew that you and I would be considering it here tonight at the Church of the Open Door, he gave an explanation of eternal life. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. What kind of life is it? It's eternal. This is life. What kind of life? Eternal life. Now, friends, if the believer is not secure, then this matter of eternal life means nothing at all. The one characteristic about it is it's eternal. It may have other characteristics, but there's one thing that is true. God is only giving eternal life to those that are saved. Now, I recognize that there are objections, and I'm going to consider them in just a moment, but I think probably I ought to take two other scriptures that are very familiar to you. One is found in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, and we should look at that. It's very important, and our Lord gave it at a time when he was challenged, and he was challenged by his enemy. Will you notice this? Verse 25, Jesus answered them. Now, the ones that he's answering are his enemies. They have challenged him, the religious rulers. Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Now, what kind of life is that? And they shall never perish. Now, if they perish, our Lord was wrong. He says that, I know my sheep, they follow me, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You could never take them out of his hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one, and the picture is this. Both are hands of deity. He says, no created thing can take them out of my hand. No created thing can take them out of my Father's hand. These are the two hands of deity, and we take our sheep. Let's see you get it. You can't get to the sheep that's in his hand. You just can't take them out. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Nothing can pluck them out of my hand. Now, that's a tremendous statement, is it not? It's an audacious statement. Now, I'm going to leave that and go over to the 8th chapter of the epistle to the Romans. And I'm reading now Romans 8, 29 and 30. For whom he foreknew, he 
also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Isn't that terrible? Verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now will you notice something here? It's very important to see this, that he's saying here. Four things. He says, predestinated first, called, and those called are justified, and those that are justified are glorified. Those are four steps. Now, do you see here he begins with predestination? People say, that's an awful doctrine. It means you're predestined to be lost. May I say, nowhere in the Word of God is predestination ever used in connection with the loss. Nowhere. What does predestination mean? It simply means, as he says here, whom he predestinates, he calls, whom he calls, he justifies, whom he justifies, he's going to glorify. All that it means is, when God starts out with a sinner that he saves, he's going to take him all the way home to glory. That's all in the world predestination means. It means that God's going to see him through. And these are the steps. Let's put it like this. He predestinates 100 sheep. How many sheep does he call? 100. How many sheep does he justify? 100. How many sheep will he glorify? 99. Huh? 99. Well, now, he gave a parable, didn't he? Let's look at it. A shepherd had a hundred sheep, and one of the little sheep got away. And what did he do? You see here, he got into the fold with 99, that's all he had, but one little sheep got lost. What's going to happen to that little sheep that got lost? Pretty good percentage, don't you think? When you start down here with a hundred sinners and you get to heaven with 99, isn't that pretty good? As these cattlemen or the sheepmen that ship begin on the range with the sheep and start to the market with them, to Chicago, if they start out with a hundred and get through with 99, they say it's good. In fact, they'd love to be able to get through with that many. But what about this shepherd? May I say that one of his little sheep got lost. Don't miss that. He got lost. One little sheep didn't make it. What did he do? He went out and he looked for that sheep till he found it, put it on his shoulder, the place of strength. He brought it into the fold. When he brought it into the fold, he had a hundred. He started out with a hundred. He got through with a hundred. And all predestination means is that God's able to get them through to glory. And he's been in the business now for 1,900 years of calling out sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, he calls. And you remember when you were called? Remember when you heard the gospel and believed? What did he do? He justified you. Didn't he justify you? You're justified. Now, he's going to glorify you. But somebody says, ooh, from here to here is a big, big leap. It's too big for me. That's what he knew. Somebody says, I may get lost. You probably will. But it won't depend on how far and how high the sheep can jump. The question is, will the shepherd be able to get them all in the fold? That's the only question. What kind of shepherd do you have? Not what kind of sheep are you? He's already said that you're a sheep, which means you're dumb and stupid and weak. That's what a sheep is. That's what he called us. And I think he smiled when he said that. He starts out with a hundred. He gets through with a hundred. Now, that's the picture that's before us here. And that's all that's before us. Don't say it's a terrible doctrine. It's a comforting doctrine for me. Because, honestly, 
there have been times when I've wondered about Vernon McGee. <laughs> and I've always felt I'd be that little sheep that got lost. But thank God he'll go out and look for the sheep till he finds him, and he won't stop till he has a hundred in the fold. What a shepherd. I praise the shepherd. There's no praise to the sheep. No use to brag on sheep. You brag on the wonderful shepherd that they have. Now, there are those who do not accept this truth, as you well know. And they have certain scriptures that they use. And I want to turn to them tonight because I want to be very fair with these folk. And these are merely samples, by the way, they're of certain classifications. In other words, that there are certain scriptures that can be answered by this one right here. Matthew 24, 13. Will you notice what it says there? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now somebody says, oh boy, I don't think I'll be able to endure to the end. You won't. Well, it says then you are not saved. May I say that this has application to the great tribulation period. Has no application to us before. If you've been with us through the Olivet Discourse, the Olivet Discourse has reference and has reference alone to the great tribulation period and the kingdom that shall follow. And when you get into that period, it's a brief period. Our Lord said, except those days were short, no flesh would survive. But he said those days are to be short. They're to be made short. And he will be able to keep how will he keep them? In the book of Revelation, we're told that they're sealed so that they are going to endure unto the end. In fact, the way that his will be marked out in this awful period is they will endure. And they will endure, not because they are wonderful, but he's put his seal upon them. He's the one that will enable them to endure to the end. So that this has its application to the great tribulation. Now, there are other passages of Scripture that have an application that's actually dispensational and does not refer today at all. You have to put these verses back in their context. Now, here, 1 Timothy 4, 1, 3, that refers to false teachers. That's the thing that he's talking about. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Somebody says, well, they'll depart from that means that there are some that are going to fall by the wayside. No, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of demons, and so on. I'll not read all of that because this has to do with false teachers. And may I say that the false teachers are those that have never been saved at all. Do you remember a few years ago that word got around that Dr. Fosdick had become a fundamentalist? And you remember how he got up and denounced, oh, he was vitriolic in his denunciation of that. Why? He said, I have never been a fundamentalist, and I'm not a fundamentalist. I'd never be a fundamentalist. In other words, Dr. Fosdick, who was brought up under fundamentalism, said that he never did believe it. You see the point. And there will be those that are false teachers. They will never have accepted the truth, but they profess it. You have to profess to accept it to become a Baptist preacher, and that's what he was. He was tried by the Presbytery also of New York. He was a Presbyterian for a while also, and he was tried. May I say that these men that come in under that category are men that actually have never been saved at all, and I'm convinced that there are many men in the ministry today because mama and papa put their hands on their head and persuaded them and turned them in that direction. That, that's the reason they're in the ministry. I was in seminary with several boys that since then have fallen by the wayside. And there, each one of those boys was there. And this one, by the way, lives in Southern California. I've had lunch with him on a couple occasions. He was a mama's boy. She made two or three trips down to the seminary to make sure he was still studying for the ministry. But he very candidly told me he never believed anything at the beginning, doesn't believe anything today. May I say that this has application 
to false teaching. It doesn't have application to a believer who has fallen away. It has no application at all to that. Now let's come to another category here, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. And this has to do with a faulty translation. There are certain words that today have changed their meaning just a little. I suppose that I've heard this one as probably as much as any verse, and let me read it. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And I've had that given to me. You can see there. Now, Paul was afraid, even this great apostle, that he would become a castaway. Well, unfortunately, the word castaway means something today. It didn't mean at the time of translation. The word in the Greek is adokimos, and it just simply means disapprove. What Paul is saying here, this has to do with translation. What Paul is simply saying is this. I want to get a reward. I'm saved. My salvation is not in danger. But he goes on to tell ahead of this that he's running like a racer to receive a prize. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Paul's not talking about salvation. He's talking about, I'm working for a crown. And I do not want to come into the presence of Christ and have him say to me, I'm sorry, Paul, you didn't finish your course. You do not get the blue ribbon for being first because you didn't finish your course. Paul says, I want to so live that when I come into his presence, He's not even talking about salvation. Paul is saved. But they are talking about whether Paul's going to receive the blue ribbon, the crown, for being first in the race. And friends, when he came to the end of his life, he could say, I finished my course. I made it. I'm coming in first. He's not there talking about salvation. He's talking about receiving a crown. Now, rewards is one thing. And salvation is something else. We work for rewards. That comes on the side of good works. But salvation is a gift, and you couldn't work for that at all. Now, may I say that Scripture does say a great deal about our lives, and I see I have left out something. No, I guess not. It's down a little farther. Luke 11, 24, 26. I wonder if I might just refer to that and go on. That is so easy to answer. You remember the Lord gave a parable about a demon possessing a man, and the demon went without the man. Then the man was swept clean and garnished, and then the demon wandered around dry places, couldn't find a place to land, so he came back to his original launching pad, and he brought seven of his friends with him, and it says the last estate of the man was worse than the First, the thing our Lord is talking about is moral reformation. This man was never regenerated. This man never became a son of God. He just got cleaned up. All he was was an empty, vacant house. He never was indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. He was just a cleaned up house. And a great many people today think that's what it means to be a Christian. I heard, by the way, on television the other night, a man make that statement. He lived a clean, moral life, and he considered himself a Christian. Well, he wasn't, according to the Bible standard. But the devil could move in with seven demons any time he wanted to and take over that man. For some reason, he hasn't done it. But a great many of these men will fall, as you well know, that all they have is moral reformation. And that's what he's referring to. Now there's another class of scriptures John 15, 6 is an example of it where the scripture talks about profession is proved by our fruits and that today the demonstration that you and I are genuine believers is by our fruits. That is, that's the way the world's going to know it. And he says, if a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. 
may I say, that has to do with fruit. That hasn't anything in the world to do with a man's salvation. It's the fruit that's in his life. And fruit is to be tested. Our Lord said, by their fruits ye shall know them. And our lives are to be tested. James is talking about faith when he writes, Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. That is, I'll show you that my faith is a living faith because a living faith produces works. He's not talking about works now. He's talking about the fact that profession has to be tested by our fruits. That's the only way you can know about another person. By their fruits you shall know them. And he's talking about a genuine saving faith will produce works. And it has to, my beloved. But that hasn't anything in the world to do here with eternal security of a genuine believer. It will show that a great many people do not have genuine fruit. You know, we're living in a day when they can now produce flowers and fruit that's more real than the real article. I see these flowers they're making today. They're better looking than the flowers I grow. I told my wife, no use me bringing in flowers anymore. You can buy them. They're not genuine, though. And fruit, they say that some of this fruit today, the birds come and pick at it. It looks so real. But it's not real. Now, a great many believers today, they're not producing that, which is, I say believers, they look like believers, but they're not believers. They do not have fruit. And fruit must be, genuine fruit must be in the life of a true believer, one who's really saved. I would insist on that. Then Paul did talk about the fact that we can lose our reward. But losing your reward doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. Will you listen to Paul over in 1 Corinthians 3.15? Now, he talks about one foundation. He talks about building on that foundation. Now, this foundation is Christ. That's the only foundation you and I can build on. Now, you can put a great big straw stack up there. But what happens? Every man's work is to be tested by fire. Well, the straw stack goes up like all these homes did out here in Bel Air. They just go right up and smoke and nothing is left. But you can also build on the foundation gold, silver. And it is interesting to see that quite a few of these people went into their homes to see what they could recover. And I noticed one of the movie actors, he found a gold plaque that he had received years ago. The fire didn't touch it but it touched everything else. It'll burn up the straw, but the gold will stand out. It'll stand the fire. Every man's work is be tested by fire. This has nothing to do with salvation. Will you listen to Paul? If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And as we've said many times, there are going to be folks in heaven that will smell like they were bought at a fire sale. And they were because they are saved. They're on the foundation, but everything they put on that foundation is nothing in the world but a straw stack, and it'll not stand the white light of his presence, the presence of the one whose eyes are like a flame of fire, because he'll just ferret it out. And everything we did for self, and everything we did for show, and everything we did because of pride, all of that will come out at that time. It's only what we've done for him. And this has to do with rewards. It has nothing in the world to do with a person's salvation. In fact, Paul says, you are saved. You are saved. But the straw stack went up in smoke, and he saved so as by fire. Then there's one other passage of Scripture. Now, I've taken up, actually, as far as I know, an example of every objection that I've ever heard to eternal security tonight. There are other Scriptures, but they fall in under one of these classifications. Now, the last one is Galatians 5, 4, and I won't even turn to it. I can refer to it. Paul speaks of falling from grace. What does it mean to fall from grace? Paul in Galatians is saying they were one time under law, no longer here under law. They've been brought now to a higher plane, and that's the plane of grace. Now, Paul says you've been saved by grace, and you're to keep on living by grace. And if you attempt to come down 
to a law plane, you're falling from grace back to a law plane to live. He didn't say that they're losing their salvation, but he's saying that they're coming down to a lower plane to live than God intended them to come to. May I say to you, friends, that eternal security rests upon something very real. And I'm going to give you now several reasons. In fact, I'm going to have to move hurriedly to do this, but I think we can do it. And if you'll let me do this very hurriedly tonight, eternal security rests upon the Word and work of God. It rests upon God the Father, and there are four things that He has done. The sovereign purpose of God. That's John 3.16. That's the sovereign purpose of God. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, that's his covenant that he made. Whosoever believeth in Christ shall be saved. That's his purpose. You have also the power of God. And we are told in Romans 8, 3, 1. My, I hope you get the book on Romans. My, it'll help you a great deal. Romans 8, 3, 1. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against you? And friends, if God is for you, who could be against you? Who could? No one, no created thing at all could be against you. Then the love of God. May I say that that's Romans 5, 7. Romans 5, 7. And I, again, I won't go into that. I've dwelt on that recently. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, don't you know that if God gave his Son to die for you, when you were a rebellious sinner going away from him, that having saved you and put into your heart a desire for him, do you think he'd ever let you go now? He'd never let you go. God loves you enough to give his son. Would you doubt the love of God? Then the fourth is, the father hears the prayer of the son. And if you doubt your salvation, go home tonight and read the Lord's Prayer. I mean John 17. And in the Lord's Prayer there, listen to him, will you? I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Listen to him. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil one. Do you think Christ has a prayer that's never been answered? And his prayer is that God will keep you. Do you think that prayer is not being answered? He's prayed. Those that you've given me, those that have believed on me, I pray you keep them. God will keep them because Christ asked for it. Notice what God the Son did. This must be very brief. Substitutionary death. May I say that if you turn to Romans... 834, you get all of this in one verse of Scripture. However, there are other verses that we could turn to. But Romans 834 will suffice. God the Son, he died a substitutionary death for us. He was raised from the dead. He's our advocate in heaven. He's our intercessor. He died down here to save us. He lives up there to keep us safe. You see, our salvation doesn't just rest on a work he did 1,900 years ago, and then he went off and left us. He hasn't gone off and left us. He's keeping those that are in the world. He's prayed the Father to keep them, and he's there to make intercession for those that are his own. I think that's the most wonderful thing that is imaginable. What a comfort that ought to be in these difficult days. Now, that's one reason that I have not got in the discussion of whether we should even have an air raid shelter or not. I got an intercessor up there that's going to take care of me, and that doesn't mean I won't go up in an atomic bomb. But if I go up in an atomic bomb, it'll be because that's the way he wanted me to go. 
And I'm not going to worry too much about that. Now God the Holy Spirit has done something to make sure that you're going to be saved. He regenerates you. He indwells you. He baptizes you. And He seals you to the day of redemption. When is the day of redemption? When He presents you to Christ at the rapture. May I say, friends, you are saved for sure up to the moment the Holy Spirit presents you to Christ up yonder. Then you're on your own. You think you'll be able to make it from there on? Don't worry till you get there. You are sealed to the day of redemption. So don't worry till you get there. I think that the Lord Jesus will be able to take over from then on and will be able to keep you after he gets you to heaven. Although he is going to have trouble with some of us. Now will you notice assurance. Assurance now rests upon an intelligent and spiritual comprehension of the Word of God. That's one reason we do not believe you can have the assurance of your salvation and be ignorant of the Word of God. Well, one of the reasons tonight that many Christians do not have the assurance of salvation, they're ignorant of what the Bible really says. Listen to Paul in Colossians 2.2, Colossians 2.2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now he talks about here the full assurance of knowledge. You need to know something. And that's the reason that it means we should have an intelligent and spiritual comprehension of the Word of God. Now, it is also a recognition of what God has done for us, and it's our entering into this by faith. Will you listen to something that Isaiah said? Turn back to the 32nd chapter of Isaiah with me. I'm trying to move as hurriedly as we can tonight to cover this subject. But back to Isaiah 32 now. Isaiah 32, verse 17. Will you listen to this? And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. The child of God who has entered into this wonderful doctrine of justification by faith, that the righteousness of Christ has been made over to him, that person that's entered into that, that is the thing Isaiah says, that he can have quietness and assurance. It's an assurance that only the Holy Spirit can give to us. Now, will you notice, I believe that the believer, every one of us, ought to be able to say with Paul without boasting or pride, here are these scriptures, or without any presumption, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know whom I have believed. Now that is something that a child of God wants us to be able to say. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to know that we're saved, that we might have joy and assurance of salvation. That's the reason John wrote his gospel. He says many other signs truly did Jesus, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, he wrote his gospel that we might be saved. He wrote his first epistle that we might know that we are saved. First John 5.13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. God wants you to know that you have eternal life. Now, what is it today that's preventing believers from having assurance? May I say that if you are a carnal believer and you have assurance tonight, that's merely presumption. God has never made any arrangement for a carnal believer to have assurance. He cannot. You read 1 John. 
Now, there are certain bases that cause a great many people today not to have assurance of salvation. And, oh, am I plugging books. But it's in this book. All of them are there and more than I can mention. But I'm going to mention them hurriedly. Some people had the gospel presented to them only partially. Now, that's the reason that I have to say I do not know whether I was saved or not. When I went down to that altar underneath a brush arbor in southern Oklahoma that was back of a Methodist church, honestly, I don't know whether I was saved or not. Nobody explained anything to me. And yet, I do know this. As I think back, I was just a boy, just a little toe-headed boy, ignorant as I could be of spiritual things. I didn't know anything about the Bible. Didn't know anything. The preacher that night preached on the prodigal son. And he told about how the father loved that boy. And, you know, my heart went out. But I honestly, nobody gave me anything. And before four months was out, I was caught stealing peaches. And I got the boy that he and I both were caught together. And I got him and I said, do you reckon that we are saved? And he said, I don't know. And we guess we lost. I guess we did. We thought we did. You see, the gospel was not presented unto us thoroughly at all. And that's one reason here when we give an invitation, we ask people to go and let a counselor sit down with them. We do want to make sure that they not only have accepted Christ, but that they know what they've done. And God wants us to know. Now, will you listen? 1 Thessalonians 1.5. And Paul had only been in Thessalonica less than a month. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Paul says that when I preached the gospel over there, I made it clear. And when you came to Christ, it came to you in power and in much assurance. And my experience has been that a great many people who think they get the assurance of their salvation really get saved. I had a couple out here when I was pastor in Pasadena. They came to me one Wednesday night. They were just new Christians. They were just glowing. They said, you know, we got the assurance of our salvation tonight. And I congratulated them. And the next Wednesday night, they came up and they said to me, correction, please. We didn't get the assurance of our salvation last Wednesday night. We got home and talked it over. We got saved. We'd really never been saved before. May I say that if you don't have assurance, maybe you weren't saved. Honestly, I mean that. I think that the gospel is to come to you in power and in much assurance. You see, he only offers one kind of salvation. That's eternal. You must got another kind if you don't have that. Now, sometimes when it's not presented in its fullness, only partially, well, people don't have assurance, but God wants them to. And I thank God for the man that talked to me about justification by faith and about you could have peace, the peace of God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Oh, I never shall forget that. That's the most wonderful thing I ever heard. You could have peace with God, being justified by faith. Now, the second thing. Some people are psychologically fearful and uncertain. And a lot of things enter in. Heredity, environment, Brought up in a background. If you will take the little book, I won't read these two examples. I put two letters in here from two different people that read this, or at least they heard the message, and they both came to an assurance of salvation. And why didn't they have it before? Because of the background that they had. My background was Methodist. Don't misunderstand. When I was a boy, the only people in West Texas and Oklahoma that was preaching the gospel were the Methodists. But that's not true today, but it was then. And I thank God for that. But there was no assurance, and that's the reason that I didn't get it in those days, you see. Now, some people have that background, and I found out a lot of people are psychologically made. May I use the illustration, the old familiar illustration? I know that I don't like to fly. I just don't enjoy it. And I do, and when I do, I don't enjoy it. I sit there miserable. And I went years ago, during the first years of Youth for Christ, 
when the planes didn't go over 10,000 feet up over to Phoenix for Youth for Christ. And a man was on the plane that morning. We all got to talking. The thing got so rough. And he said to me, he said, I've flown around the world. This is the roughest trip I've ever taken. I thought the thing was hitting bottom there several times. Somebody tried to tell me that they don't fall. That one fell. I don't know how far it went down, but it went way down. And I was frightened. And I held on to the seat. and I just grabbed it and hold on to it. And that's crazy. That seat in front of me was falling just like the one I was sitting in. But I held on to it. It felt good. And across from us was a fella, and we finally waked him up. He had flown, I think he said, 57 missions over Germany. He was a pilot. He just dozed all the way over. Never bothered him a bit. He thought we were silly to be even uneasy about that. May I say to you, that plane offered me as much security as it offered him. If that plane went down, he'd go down just like I did. If that plane landed safely, which it did, I'd land just as safely as he did. The difference was he had assurance and I didn't. That's the difference. Now, there are a lot of people today say, but because of their background, because of their psychological makeup, they just don't have the assurance of their salvation. But God wants you to have it. May I say that? Now, there are those that are out of the will of God. I'll not go into that. I do not think if you're out of the will of God, you can have the assurance of your salvation. Unconfessed sin in the life of a believer will disturb you. And may I say that if you've got unconfessed sin, you cannot have assurance of salvation. You know that robs you of assurance of salvation. And then there are those today that are anticipating some great emotional experience. They're expecting somehow or another. I had a man, again, out here in Pasadena. And that man never did. And to this good day, he's an old man now, ready to pass over. He's saved, but he doesn't know whether he is or not. I've gone over this ground with him a hundred times. And he says, well, it looks to me like I'd have a great emotional experience. He says, now that man, Paul on a Damascus road, look what happened to him. And nothing's happened to me. You just presented Christ and I accept him and nothing's happened. I've had no great emotional upheaval. I should have some great experience. And that's what he's been looking for. He's still looking for it. And he's never had it. He never will. But when he goes in God's presence, I think he'll get one then. Because he sure won't think he was going there. But he will. And I've tried to tell him. I said, sure, Paul had a great emotional experience. Well, what about the Ethiopian eunuch? He had none whatsoever. All he did was pick up a hitchhiker. And the hitchhiker presented Christ to him. And he got saved. That's all it was. May I say to you that there are those that tonight, and there may be those here saying, well, I've never had any great emotional experience. My friend, it all rests upon the Word of God, what God says, and whether you can take God at His Word. Then there are those that say, well, I don't want to say that I'm saved. That seems to me to be a lack of proper humility to say that we're saved and we know it. My friend, it's merely taking God at his word. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Listen, my friend, do you believe God? God says if you have his Son, you have life. Do you trust his Son? then you have life. On what basis? Your feeling? Your experience? No, sir. It rests upon exactly what God says. Can you believe God? You honor God when you believe Him. You dishonor Him when you do not believe Him. You glorify God when you tell Him that you accept His Son and you're resting only upon that. Now suppose as we close, and I'm closing now, Suppose that as I close, a telegram was handed to me. And the telegram was from, well, it was from Mr. Rockefeller. He says, I understand that you have been talking about me, and I want to show you my goodwill. If you will meet me tonight 
in the lobby of the Biltmore Hotel, I will give you a check for your missionary program for $100,000. Well, why not make it that long as we're dreaming? Let's have a good one. Suppose he said, I got a telegram that said that. Now, look, where would I be tonight at 12 o'clock? Home in bed? Well, you're wrong. I'd be down at 11.30. I wouldn't want to miss it. I'd be down there waiting for him, you see. It would be taking him at his word. Taking him at his word. Believing what he said. And suppose I did go home and go to bed, and he called me up at 12.30 and says, Did you get my telegram? I said, Yes. Well, he says, Why aren't you down here? Well, I said, I didn't believe you. I don't think I'd get the $100,000. At least I wouldn't honor him. May I say we honor God when we take him at his word. And he says if we'll trust Christ, we have eternal life. And he says, I want you to have assurance.